Okay, this is for you, my boy. Foreign Outcast. Did I say it right? You comment on my video. I said, do this one, do this video. So I'm going to do it for you, my boy. And if other people want me to react others, other people, I'm going to do it too. Just comment down below and I'm going to do it. And one thing I, I could not do is the the music. Because they got a lot of copyrights. So I'm not going to do music. But if it's this, let's do it, man. Let's get it. That's four months ago. Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this episode, we head back to New York City. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. I covered both of these topics in previous videos. So if you haven't already seen them, I recommend you go check them out. But maybe- I hope I don't have copyright too, cause I heard the beats. I hope I, I muted the music, I don't know. Maybe that's a lot to ask, so let me break down some background information. The early 1950s in Chicago's northwest side represented major change. The historically Greek, Italian, and Eastern European area had a large influx of Puerto Rican residents. Well, just like any impoverished neighborhood, groups began forming for protection. So in 1954, a man named Ram Rican residents. Well, just like any Why you wear a pum pum shirt? The one with the red. Don't come at me, bro. I'm just saying. Don't come at me. I'm not a gangster. Please stop it. Don't come at me. I'm just saying, why you wear a poop on shirt? Let's go. Any impoverished neighborhood, groups began forming for protection. So in 1954, a man named Ramon Santos started the Latin Kings. The name originated from Ramon's idea of structuring his guys like a monarchy. This meant that everyone had a ranking and those at the bottom had to listen to their higher ups no matter what. His plan was to take over Chicago while being the most organized and discreet in the city. Well, as others formed in the area such as the Latin Disciples, Papa King wanted the kings to stand out in their own way. So he adopted black and gold as their colors and he took this coordination very seriously. That's because black represented darkness and evil and gold represented light and prosperity. Well, long story short, the Latin Kings grew to be one of the largest and most feared in Chicago throughout the 1960s and 70s. Wild rivalries with Ambrose, Black Pea Stones, and the Latin Disciples shaped a dark and dangerous era for many living in the area. However, despite knowing the risks of joining this life, thousands continued to join the Latin Kings. God That's damn. because they offered the love of a family and the loyalty of an army. Their slogan was Amor de Rey, meaning love from the king in Spanish, and this truly represented their vibe. The Latin Kings truly filled the family void that many impoverished kids grew up lacking in their homes. At the start, all the members were from Puerto Rico. However, they began accepting members from various Latin countries. And that takes us all the way down to Havana, Cuba. I love Cuban girls. I don't know why, but I love Cuban. They got big. Big. Mm -mm. mm -mm. In 1976, Cuba elected a man named um, Fidel Castro. Shit, he was spin. known for his radical views and this caused many Cubans to panic when he was elected. So right uh, away, thousands of Cubans fled their home country. The departure went in two waves, the first being those who had the funds to pay their way out of Cuba. Many of these people moved to Miami oh and God. built back their professional lives. Uh, the second wave, well, this one was a bit different. By 1980, Everything. it was nearly impossible to leave Cuba. Some residents manually built rafts and tested the waters, but that was far in between. However, on April 15th, 1980, Castro agreed to finally let some Cubans leave. These happened to be the people that he no longer wanted and this included all of the country's prisoners. One of those was a young man named Luis Felipe. The 17 year old was serving a 10 year sentence when the guards let him out and he was airlifted to America. Due to his refugee status, the government sheltered him and sent him on a flight to Chicago. I know I'm gonna get copyright. Cause them beats is crazy. <laughs> All of this not knowing that he's supposed to be serving 10 years. Well, Luis arrived in Chicago without knowing a single person and without having a single dollar either. So for months he slept under bridges and hustled to get money in any way he could. Well, while hustling in Northwest Chicago, Luis met some Latin Kings and instantly developed a bond. 
Right away, Luis joined the Kings, surpassing most of their usual steps. That's because he was wild and everyone was afraid of him. Rumors say that just in his first year as a King, Luis caused more damage than any member in Chicago. God this damn. earned him the nickname King Blood. God damn. He rung bells throughout the city, even to the point where Chicago Wait, police were that? dedicating Watch. teams to track him down. Well, the Kings knew that he was bringing too much attention to the <sighs> city, so both parties agreed that he would leave Chicago and lay low. In 1981, Luis moved to the Bronx in New York City. And because he was the only Latin king around, Luis left that life alone and instead lived a normal life with his girlfriend. However, a year later, Luis would get mad at his girlfriend and make an unfortunate decision. Sadly, she passed away and Luis got nine years. Information yeah. about the case is very hard to find. All we know is that he was responsible in some way. So in March of 1982, Luis was sent to Collins Correctional Facility. This is a notorious facility where only the strong survive. However, for Luis, Luis, this was light work, nothing compared to his life in Cuba. Either way, he knew that as an individual, he was outnumbered by anyone who he got into it with. And the first thing he noticed was the lack of Latino unity within the facility. Unlike Chicago, where they had a strong presence in the system, in New York, they had nothing at all. So that's when Luis started the New York chapter of the Latin Kings. He sat down with dozens of inmates and explained to them what the Latin Kings are. Well, after explaining what membership would... I don't have too many hands. I only have two hands. Why they have four hands? Wait, did he do it in the mirror? What the hell? It's like an umbrella. It's like an umbrella shit. Look. Pew pew. Pew 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 pew. The fuck is going on? Y'all niggas creative or some shit. They got talent for doing those scenes. God damn it. Tom now, bitch. That's it. Until nearly everyone joined. Just like that, the Latin Kings had a presence in the Collins Correctional Facility. Under Luis's leadership, they started running the facility however they wanted, and they would quickly expand beyond the four walls. Let me explain. As members would be released back into society, they began taking their new affiliations with them. And just like that, the Latin Kings spread throughout New York. By 1990, there were thousands of Latin Kings roaming around New York City in their black and gold. They secured control in quite a few areas, something that many people <laughs> Gangsters, yo, possible. gangsters. However, the Latin Kings were worse than anything New York had ever seen. They wanted to take over by any means, especially by force. They truly had no respect for New York's underground establishment. Damn. And you can only blame one person for that, Luis Felipe. Damn. And because he started the chapter, Luis was the undisputed leader. That meant... That's crazy. Only one man did everything. That's crazy. Yo, MS-13 is... They're dangerous, I got la. I must certain is dangerous. You're still away from them. That he called the shots from his cell. To do this, he mailed letters to his top members in the city. He How the hell are his hand feet inside? How the hell his hand feet inside the mail? He's Felipe. Because he started the chapter, Luis was the undisputed That's crazy. leader. That meant that he called the shots from his cell. To do this, he mailed letters to his top member. How he fit inside the mailbox. Ow. His whole body go inside the mailbox. Ow. Ow. So his whole body inside the mailbox. The whole body is inside the mailbox. And then he to give him the letter. Ah his butt and his bones and his body go inside the mailbox. That's unbelievable. I'm telling you, them gangster they can do whatever they want. No cap. Stay away from them. I'm telling you. If you're not in the game properly, if you're not fit for this, don't be in the game. Cause one thing you're not feeding and you be a snitch all that see how you be see what happened just 
his whole body inside a box. That's crazy. Members in the city. He Boom. would write them and they would write Job back, done. often sending them on missions. Luis was known to order missions for the smallest reasons. That's sometimes crazy. out of pure boredom, just to set an example. Well, this as the good. kings gained much control of the streets, they became territorial and didn't take well to new groups coming along. And that takes us all the way down to Salvador. Then goes decades, the country of El Salvador to El Salvador. After a wild couple of decades, the country of El Salvador was left in a devastated state. And because of this, hundreds of thousands of residents risked their lives to move to America as refugees. The vast majority went to California. However, the second most ended up in New York, specifically Long Island. No. I'm assuming that many of you aren't familiar with this area, so let me break it down. Long Island consists of Kings and Queens, which are actual New York City. Then you have Nassau and Suffolk County. That's Both MS of these are suburban areas. Areas that I must have been in pretty quiet. Well, nearly 90,000 Salvadorian men moved all over Long Island. This is because of open jobs in the assembly plants and textile factories. Well, one of these people was a young teenager named Edgar Torres. Edgar At 10 Torres. years old, Edgar traveled by himself from El Salvador to San Diego. After the treacherous journey, he was sent to Freeport, New York. There, he lived with a family member and jacked clothes from local stores to earn money to survive. However, by age 12, Edgar Edgar opted to move out and live in an apartment building dedicated to Salvadorian refugees. That would be on 45th and Broadway in Queens, not an area most people would want to live in. Edgar had pretty much moved from the safe suburbs to one of the worst neighborhoods possible. And when he arrived, he began running into issues with the Latin Kings. Unfortunately, they would mock him and his friends as they would walk to school every morning. Instantly, Edgar knew that they needed some sort of protection against the Kings. So he got together with his friends and started a click. Because they hung out in front of the 7-Eleven on Broadway, he decided to call them the Los 7-Elevens. Wow, that has to be the worst name I've ever heard. And the Latin Kings felt the exact same way. They laughed at the notion of any resistance in their territory, especially by some guys named after a convenience store. However, that would later change. Let me explain. After all of this transpired, the word quickly spread around the Salvadorian community, specifically in LA. And there is where MS-13 were already the most feared in all of California. Yep. So when they got word of what was going on in New York, they were furious and wanted to help their I'm not doing it. They heard Damn it. I'm not supposed to do it. Damn. I'll take it back. family members about the building oh, on 45th God. and Broadway and what was going on. So in July of 1991, six MS members flew out to New York. Gee. The six members waited outside the 45th and Broadway building until they ran into Edgar Torres. There, they tapped on his shoulder and asked if he could call a meeting with everyone he knows. So that night, the six MS members presented what their affiliation is all about. They sold the locals on the idea that they needed more strength or else the Latin Kings would take control of them. So without second thought, Edgar and all of the 7-Elevens became Familia Mara Salva. Wait, 7-Eleven, is that a store? Yeah, it's a store. So that's me. Is one of the gangsters on 7-Eleven? I'm confused. That's crazy, man. Trucha. This was New York's very first MS presence. Well, after successfully establishing it, the six members returned to LA and appointed Edgar Torres to lead the way. And once this happened, the Latin Kings had no choice but to pay attention. However, at this time, the Kings had reached complete dysfunction, enough to distract them from the growing MS in their area. And that takes us to 1993. At this point, Luis Felipe had been in total control of everything for so long that it made him fall in love with the power. Coincidentally, a top member named Rafael so Gonzalez, good. also known as King Mousy, was gaining power within the Kings. Mousy was charismatic, fierce, and people listened to his words. So for quite some time, Luis was hearing about King Mousy being a potential threat to his power. In May of 1993, Luis ordered Damn. William Cartagena, also known as King Lil Man, to take out King Mousy. Well, here's the major issue. 
King Lil Man liked King Mousy and so did everyone in New York. Fast forward to October of 1993 and King Mousy is still around with no attempts to take him out. Luis usually would want this done in under a week, but due to his respect for King Lil Man, he granted him months to get it done. Well, October marked five whole months and Luis felt disrespected. So instead, he figured that Lil Man would never do it and ordered three other kings to get it done. October 30th, 1993. Three kings run inside of Mousy's apartment in Queens. There they see his brother-in-law, Victor Hirschman. Despite not knowing who he is, they won't take a chance. Bam. Wow. They run to the back That's of the crazy. apartment and they see that Mousy had escaped through the back window. Either way, the principle is what mattered more to Luis Felipe. Those three did in one week what Lil Man couldn't do in five months. So in November of 1993, Luis started accusing King Lil Man of taking money from his fellow kings. A claim that some kings would say is bogus. Either way, this was enough reason to get him gone. So Luis ordered Jose Gabriel, also known as King Teardrop, to take care of King Lil Man. That's then crazy. He ordered Ismael Rios, also known as King JR, and Ronnie Gonzalez to get his wife, Queen Margie. So by the end of November, King Lil Man was found in a queen's alley. Wow. It's safe to say that King Teardrop got the job done in a timely manner. However, after multiple tries, Ismail and Ronnie couldn't do it. Their morals wouldn't allow it. So they finally decided to let Queen Margie be. This infuriated Luis Felipe once again because he could sense that the kings were losing respect and trust in his word. So Luis instantly sent two kings to take care of Ismail and Ronnie. In January of 1994, Ismail was found inside of his car and Ronnie somehow got away. God damn, he's a gangster for real. He sent him shot. <laughs> sending, sending everybody to kill. That's crazy. This was a constant cycle of dysfunction within the kings that NYPD started to catch up on. The Latin Kings investigations. Back in April of 1993, the Fed started intercepting Luis Felipe's letters back and forth. They would make copies of the letters but eventually let them go through. That way they were able to get everything they needed. So in 1995, Luis Felipe was charged with everything I just talked about. And in March of 1995, he got double life, all to be done in solitary confinement. That means 23 hours alone in a cell and one hour alone- Is that a car crush? And in March of 1995, he got double life, all to be done in solitary confinement. That means 23 hours- That's a, that's a mouse or a car crush? Right here. Right here. Alone is in moving. The cell and one hour alone in the yard. This way, Luis <sighs> could no longer run the Latin Kings. So, with Luis practically being gone, another man took over the Latin Kings. That would be a man named Antonio Fernandez, also known as King Tone. And this guy had a completely different vision for the organization. He wanted to turn them into a street organization and get away from their previous identity. He truly wanted to turn them positive, and his leadership definitely did a good job. But unfortunately, this wouldn't last forever. By the 2000s, MS had grown into large numbers in New York, and over the years they kept pushing the king's limits. So after a while, the kings had enough, and this became a battle of the heavyweights. We start out way in the suburb of Brentwood, New York, located 40 minutes from the city. Historically, Brentwood was a quiet suburb where New York cops and firemen bought houses and raised their families away from the mountains. That's a nice, that's However, a nice house. By the 2000s, the city was filled with kings and MS members, something they had never seen before. The street life started playing out way in the safe suburbs. Well, everything started out at Brentwood High School, where the two groups were constantly getting into it. Once MS leaders got word of this, they called on a young member to quote-unquote put in work. That would be a young man named Carlos Ortega, also known as Silencio. And that takes us to February 17th, 2010. Silencio decides that he will lure an alleged Kings member named David Sandler to meet up with him. So he Facebook messages him and David agrees to meet him near his home on Timber Lane Drive. 5 p.m. David arrives with two friends and Silencio pulls up alone. Silencio walks up to his car window and bam. That's how they call him Silencio. Because he's moving he move silence. That's crazy. Silencio, por favor. 
this was one of the very first incidents to ever happen in the quiet Brentwood neighborhood. And after this incident, MS wouldn't be done causing problems in the suburbs. The next week after this incident, Silencio and his right-hand man Boxer go have dinner at El Rancho Grill in Hampstead, New York. Well, for whatever reason, they decide not to pay their tab and they try to leave. But while exiting, a security guard stops the two and orders them to pay. Of course, this guy has no idea who he's talking to. And because of this, he tackles Boxer and holds him to the ground until he agrees to pay his tab. After all of this transpires, Boxer looks the guard in his eyes and says, look, it's not going to end like this. And unfortunately, he was not lying. March 6, 2010. Boxer returns to El Rancho Grill. There he sees the same security guard, so he walks up and BAM! Just when you thought Silencio and Boxer were done, the madness would certainly continue. The next week after this, Silencio and Boxer are ordered to take care of a member named Mario Quijada. Apparently, Mario had not been following his orders to apply pressure on the rival kings. So this prompted the leaders to want him gone. March 17th, 2010. Silencio and Boxer call Mario Quijada to meet up and hang out at the beach. So they pick up Mario from his Nassau home and drive him all the way down to Far Rock away beach. There they get out of the car and walk him out to the water. Bang. God damn! All of this just because he wasn't applying pressure on the kings. Anyway, let's of murder. go back on track to the main theme, MS versus the kings. And that takes us to Jamaica, Queens. This neighborhood has historically been known so for its crazy. rappers like 50 Cent, Ja Rule, Fredro Starr, oh, Onyx, shit. Tony Yayo, Nicki Minaj, and many more. But since 2010, the area has adopted a reputation for a different side. An MS clique called Centralis Locos Salvatruchas has grown to be one of the most feared in all of New York. On the other hand, the That's Latin Kings that. now have a large presence in Jamaica, Queens as well. They call themselves the Black Mob and they're nothing to play with either. And that takes us to 2000. 2012. At this point, CLS are led by a man named Marcelo Esquival, also known as Profugo. And this guy does not like the Latin Kings, specifically a member named Daniel Licona Gonzalez. July 2nd, 2012. Profugo sends two of his young members to ride their bikes down to 149th and Low Court. This is a known Latin Kings territory of Jamaica, Queens. There they may find Daniel. And of course, there he is on the corner. So the members scream La Mara and pedal up to him and without hesitation bang. this incident heightened the rivalry even more however 90 percent of it goes unreported and unsolved because both sides of cops got a lot of cops have a lot of job to do that's crazy Damn. Died by the same codes. So that takes us to May 18th, 2017. A black mob Latin king named Jonathan Garcia, also known as J.O., decides to go on a mission. This time looking for an MS member named Daniel Flores, also known as Monster. So he rides his bike down to 9428 88th Street, and there he finds Monster. So J.O. approaches. Bam. That's crazy. Eventually, after three indictments, everyone in this video went down. And one thing about New York is that you know that they're doing serious time. Currently, it's unknown what this rivalry consists of because both sides make sure to keep everything secret. Well, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Peace. Yo. What in the world? <laughs> what in the world? It's a lot of shit. I'm kind of scared. I'm not in the game, but I'm kind of scared. What the hell? It's a lot of men, bro, killing niggas left and right. What the hell? Cats have a lot of job to do. You gotta have an overtime for the shit. What the hell is going on? Oh, man, I'm out, man. I got a shit.